Wanna talk? So let's talk. Yeah. Talk. You wanna talk. You gotta talk, you need to talk. News talk. I talk, you talk to Solomon. I talk, you talk to Solomon. Yeah, let's talk to Solomon. Good evening and welcome. It's Talk to Solomon time, and we are delighted to have with us as our co-host, Greg W. Howard of uh, the uh, financial fame. Greg, how are you? Where's Greg? Okay. Oh, I'm here. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Caught you. Uh, and then the former police chief, Steve Davis. Good evening. And, of course, our star of the night, uh, former ambassador, uh, Dr. Alan Keyes. Alan, how are you, sir? Hi, Stan. How are you? Hi, Chief. Hi, Hello. Greg. I saw Hello. Your, I saw your cameo in 2016, by the way. Oh, yeah. Somebody told me about that. I haven't seen it yet. Well, it's a, it's a great movie, and uh, we're going to talk about that a little later. But I want to start talking about the saints. Not all the saints, just one saint, St. Bernard. In fact, a guy named Steve St. Bernard. We talked about the story once before, but he's just been nominated for some award. <clears throat> this is the bus driver. 45-year-old father who saw a child dancing on a, an air conditioner, but three stories up in the air. And he ran, uh, and, and by his own words, praying, God, let me get there in time. That child's going to fall. And as he got there, the child didn't fall. She flew. She thought she could fly. A, a child with some, some challenges. This little girl, six or seven, whatever she was, jumped to her death. Only a saint caught her, hurt himself rather severely, it turns out, is recovering from that, but she, nothing happened. She didn't get a scratch. She thought it was great fun. Um, and we celebrate, and I think it's not a, a, a coincidence. Uh, your thoughts, uh, Dr. Keith? Well, I, I think that there are times in life when you just have to stand in awe before the providence of God uh, and the fact that he moves and moves, by the way. And I think the thing that has always intrigued me about that story is uh, you see God moving through the heart of a human being, right? And, and, and it's always wise to remember, I think, as you look at those circumstances, that uh, that heart is moved and inspired by God and, and calls on God for help after committing to that course of action which God has put on his heart. But there is a choice that has to be made, and he made that choice and committed himself to it, trusting uh, in God uh, and God relying on his, that man's goodwill uh, in order to achieve uh, his purpose. And I think that's where we stand in relation to God uh, in terms of uh, wanting always to wait and see miracles and not sometimes, I think, stand remembering that we may be indeed the instrument through which God intends to work that miracle for someone. Well, I think that is absolutely brilliant and, in fact, the case that all too often we think there's going to be uh, bolts of lightning, claps of thunder, the, the seas parting, the heavens parting. No, it's going to be... Uh, God inspiring uh, or a heart that's open to God responding. Maybe that's a better way to say it. Uh, let, let me just shut up here and let some other folks say uh, Chief? Well, one thing, uh, Dr. Keyes, it was a very elegant description of God's actions through the heart. I love that a lot. But like in my case, I'm a career law enforcement person. I was, I've been paid uh, many times to put myself in danger, but that was with training, trained to be prepared for those moments. So here is a moment, though, when someone who wasn't trained for this, wasn't prepared for this, and the choice is someone should do something or I'm going to do something. And this saint elected to do something and, and even put himself in jeopardy and at risk to save this other person. And, I think, and you're right. It's, it's an act of God. It's a great description, and, and I'm glad we got to see this story and talk about it. People who are not familiar with trauma do not understand that a six-year-old girl who weighs, for the sake of discussion, 40 pounds, 40 pounds coming down three stories that force can break your neck 
that force can kill you. That force is, I mean, a, a, a 40 pound bag of sand, if someone dropped that from three stories and that landed on you, you'd be dead. Greg, you have some experience in these areas and being in the military. Greg? Greg? I can barely make out what you're talking about. I'm sorry, this connection's really bad now. All right, sorry. well, what we're going to do is we're going to disconnect you and then reconnect you so that we can try and make it better. So we'll get your comment on the other side of that. All right, okay. let, let us uh, talk about the, uh, a, a guy named Michael Clark Duncan. Uh, Alvin, are you familiar with this wonderful, in my opinion, didn't know the man personally, saw him in a number of uh, films, always liked him, always felt something special there. Here's a young man, he was four, 54 years old, died of a heart attack. He was the giant of a man in the Green Mile who, who was, you know, the hero of that movie. Uh, your thoughts? I'm not hearing Alan. Just a minute, Alan. We're not hearing you. If you're hearing me. Sorry. Okay, go ahead. I forgot to turn the mic on. All right. No, I was just going to say, I, I guess I'm one of the few people uh, in the universe who hasn't seen The Green Mile. But I uh, have uh, seen uh, him in some of the uh, films that I have occasionally gone to over the years uh, with my kids. Uh, and he always played characters uh, who I think were uh, attractive. I didn't know that much about him uh, in terms of his own uh, life, though. It's like a lot of folks who you see on the screen. You know them through their characterizations, but you don't really know who they are. Well, here's a man that was digging ditches and got a break. Of course, they were just looking for a big black guy, and he was a big black guy. Uh, and then his talent came through, and, and he always talked about the fact that God smiled on him. He, he was a Christian man. He was a, uh, you know, he's the quintessential opposite of our president, in my humble opinion. Well, he, he went from digging ditches to a great, wealthy, and, and, and fabulous career because of America. The opportunities that exist here in this country, the exact thing that Obama is trying to destroy. Well, well, I'm sorry, Chief. Haven't you been haven't you been taking your lessons though? He didn't do that. <laughs> oh, you're right. No, <laughs> it was it was because of of the fact that they of, built of, they built roads in Hollywood. It was because some politician uh, pro politicians program and so forth. He didn't do that. The government did that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we we'll go back to our last guy, Saint Bernard. When someone said. Uh, to him, you're a hero. He said, no, a hero is a sandwich. I'm just a dad. And I was in the right place at the right time to do the right thing. God, does that make me proud. I mean, I wish this guy was in my family uh, so I could be even more proud if that's possible. That's what America is about. They, no, it does, I don't know if the child was white or black. I don't think it makes any difference. Uh, the, I, I've seen his picture, so I know he's black, and that doesn't make any difference. Here's a, a, a man who's married, taking care of his family, working. He's a bus driver uh, and knew right when he saw right needed to be done. That's the story of America, in my humble opinion. Now, Greg, you back with us? Yeah, I can make out a, a lot more now. <laughs> Sorry. Well, we were talking about this man who, uh, first of all, the guy from the Green Mile, that, that died, yeah. that, that, uh, that just rips my heart uh, a little bit because I think we've lost a, a, a good person. Uh, and the, the former, the fellow that, that, that caught that child. Uh, that's what we were talking about. Okay. Uh, well, uh, first of all, regarding the actor, I always liked him because uh, there was something about every character he played that I found um, drew me to that character. The Green Mile character... You know, you just you just felt for the character. There was something genuine about him that came across, regardless of whatever role he was playing. So, and I think that it, it comes from knowing his background. He was a good man. He was a hardworking man, and he was discovered to fill character roles. Uh, this is 
not an attractive place in Hollywood. You, you often don't get a lot of work, but for some reason, he connected with a lot of viewers or, or moviegoers, and as a result, he became very endearing to folks, and he became very wealthy. And this is because of America that he was able to do this. And so I think that we lost a good man. He was, as I understand it, he was a God-fearing man and cared deeply about everything uh, to an extent that really came across, and you just can't, you can't fake that. You can't act it. There are some actors that you know are just hollow and empty inside. Alec Baldwin comes to mind. But this was a man that you felt was something there. Well, you know what? I, I must disagree with you, my, my friend Greg, because I think Alec Baldwin is not hollow. I think he's full of crap. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just, just a subtle reminder. All right. I have a list in front of me of seven economic facts affecting black Americans. I'm sure I sent this article to you, uh, Dr. Keyes, but I want to talk about these and, and get your comment. 27% of black Americans now live in poverty, a 2% increase, almost a 10% increase since 2009. Your thoughts? Well, you know, Stan, I, I think there is absolutely no doubt, uh, partly just because of the phenomena that has been true uh, pretty much throughout my lifetime, at least, that whenever you have hard times, the times will hit hardest against uh, the vulnerable communities. Uh, and the black community, particularly in the urban areas and such the like, are, are vulnerable. Uh, and very often you see uh, an exaggerated effect that I think has become quite deep and profound uh, in the course of what is now, of course, a crisis that extends uh, to all different communities and especially to all of the different folks who constitute our great middle class or did uh, in the United States. Uh, and I think the irony of this is the sad and tragic truth that a lot of folks went to the polls in 2008 thinking that they were going to cast a vote that was somehow going to show their pride racially and all of this. Uh, and ended up putting into the White House somebody who has been a bane of the community economically, except, of course, for those minions that directly benefited from the largesse that helped to build his political empire. we got to make sure of that. So that the overall situation uh, is awful as we move down the road toward this Obama-imposed, government-imposed, elitist-imposed socialism. Uh, but the other thing, Stan, that I think we ought to keep in mind is that I think that this is a situation where people uh, were carried along by what, by what I thought was essentially, to be quite frank about it, a racist argument. An argument that contradicted everything that, for instance, Martin Luther King stood and fought for, where you're going to judge people by the content of their character and, and going to judge them on the basis of how their deeds comport with the standards of uh, decency that you hold dear. Uh, instead, you had folks saying, well, I have both of the black guy and this and that. Does he believe as you believe? Do you think we ought to be killing babies uh, who uh, were the subject of uh, uh, or the victims of, of failed abortion attempts? Do you think that we ought to be tearing down the institution of marriage and so forth? And they said, no, no, I don't believe any of that. But go ahead. And, and they went ahead and voted for somebody who did. Uh, and in the process, I think, sadly, when you think through the implications of establishing an elitist dominated socialist system for this country. You are essentially betraying the doctrine of unalienable rights, individual rights, respect for uh, the qualities and character and achievements of individuals. Uh, that was exactly what Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement and others in America uh, who have fought on the basis of our allegiance to the Declaration of Independence principles is exactly what they fought for. I've always commented that this is a fellow who represents the repudiation of the heritage uh, that was bathed in spirit and blood and courage uh, by people over generations, and, and he essentially sacrifices all of it, abusing it in the name of a commitment to an ideology uh, that essentially rejects God, rejects God-endowed rights, rejects the Constitution based upon those rights, rejects uh, the kind of appeal to uh, human conscience. Uh, that was based not on materialism, but on the understanding that as human beings, which is what we talked about in the opening of the show, we have choices to make. And if we make those choices in accord with uh, the gracious will of God, uh, then we stand in his favor, blessed by him, and share that blessing 
uh, with the world. The courage to understand that and to see that heritage which valued the spiritual, valued those who, though they didn't have a whole lot of money and wealth and so forth, nonetheless were people who were loving uh, mothers and grandmothers and grandfathers and hardworking folks who tried to raise up decent kids. The kind of environment in which I grew up and you realized that it's not a matter of how much wealth you have or what good opinion people have of you or even whether they despise you on the account of the, uh, the color of your skin because there is a precious good inside of you uh, that has to do with God's favor and your relationship with God and is always under the control uh, of your own willingness to commit yourself to doing what is right by others. Uh, and, and I think that the whole appro approach that this man represents, this government-dominated approach, saturated in materialism, where you abdicate your will to the control of some socialist-minded elite, it betrays that whole heritage. So in so many ways, uh, I think the black community is suffering economically, it's suffering spiritually, uh, and I think at the end of the day, too, the country suffers, finally. Because I cannot remember a period of years when I think there has been such a spectacle of commitment to things that far from validating what so many good-hearted Americans wanted to do in the way of getting us beyond uh, the whole obsession with race and the whole scourge of racism, I think we've actually seen in Obama and Eric Holder and these people actions and activities that aggravate the divisions amongst our people that rouse a kind of righteous indignation, uh, and that instead of building on what was, I think, the goodwill of Americans who voted for this guy pretty much sight unseen because they wanted to make a statement uh, about uh, justice and, uh, and equality in spite of uh, all uh, these uh, 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 charges of racism, uh, I've disappointed that, but I think he is now. Also, in the kind of performance that he's delivered, he's actually made the situation worse uh, and has, in some respects, by his behavior, sadly, validated bigotry uh, by giving preference to people like these Black Panther thugs and instead of uh, prosecuting them as justice required and so forth. Um, so I think that kind of favoritism, in addition to uh, the constant harping on the notion that if I'm not doing a good job, it's because you're a racist. I mean, that's such sickness. Uh, and I think it has angered and aggravated people uh, who were, in fact, not only ready, but willing and able to try to do something uh, that would exemplify the country's goodwill. Uh, and I think they spit on that. Uh, and, and it's sad. And I think the, the end result of it is going to be, uh, and is, uh, an atmosphere that uh, damages the country and I think is going to take a while to heal. Well, I would agree with you. I'm going to go through these so, so that everyone can comment. 27% of blacks now live in poverty. That's an increase of nearly 10%. According to last month's Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, the unemployment rate in the black community is 14.1%, dramatically higher than the 8.3%, and both of those are phony numbers. They're much higher. Um, white Americans have 22 times more wealth than black Americans. That, that number has doubled the difference. Uh, now the average black family has a net worth of less than $5,000. The average white family has a net worth of $110,000. And of course, Obama would have to have you take away 105 of the 110, but not give a damn thing to the blacks, just have government take it all. Um, the real median annual income uh, is down uh, for the black family uh, from 36,567 to 32,498 for whites. Um, it's down uh, from 56,000 or 51,000 or something like that. Uh, and we can go on. The fact is, if anyone would look at this list, and I'll, and I'll go around the horn here, starting with Greg, how could any a black person with any intelligence at all want more of this? Greg? Well, I'm reminded of my college economics textbook 101. One, te one chapter stood out at, and always comes to mind in times like this. It was called inflation, the cruelest tax. Inflation is a regressive tax. Obama's policies have been inflationary and as a result he can claim he has raised taxes not on the lower class but by his very actions. 
by having the Federal Reserve have to constantly print money and issue stock, uh, buy up stock certificates and buy up and monetize the debt, they have created inflation. Now, the way the government calculates inflation for consumers, they leave out food and energy. Food and energy are the two things that impact the poorest among us the most. So as a result, like I said, inflation is a regressive tax. Now, while we have made great strides towards equality, we were never quite there. So blacks typically had fallen and had st- had uh, or had stayed in the lower economic strata of our society. So it comes as no surprise to me to find out that blacks have suffered a greater loss of median income uh, in terms of real income. Real income is defined as the wages against the real cost of goods and services. In other words, against inflation. More blacks falling into poverty. Again, the co- your real income against the lower boundary line of poverty as measured by an inflationary society. So again, all these policies are designed to lift up the bankers. They monetize debt in order to keep the government looking prosperous. But in essence, they are hurting the poorest among us. And unfortunately, that includes blacks to a greater extent than any other segment of society because of our past failings, which we were starting to get over. Now, Dr. Dr. Keyes there was extremely eloquent in how this has damaged the psyche of the American people in terms of race relations. But as you know, economics is my field, and this has damaged people immeasurably economically, and blacks have fallen on the sword the hardest for their support of Obama. Chief? I'm going to give the GOP a big part of the blame for this because I believe they're cowards when it comes to the race debate. And time and time again, I've heard Republican politicians at many different levels make some type of a comment that's, that's in defense of supporting the black community, and they get chastised by some of the, the black elite, especially in the news media, and then the GOP backs off of those comments. For example, I've heard a politician here in Indiana one time talk about how taxes and, and the system was a, was a part of a, a financial plantation for the black community. Well, they were reprimanded for that by the, by the black liberals instead of sticking to their guns and saying, yes, by golly, the, the system is really bad for the black community. They backed up, oh, I'm sorry, I apologize. Oh, forgive me for saying anything at all about this issue. So I think they have a big part of the blame. But, but the part for me, um, all my friends that I have, for the most part, are conservatives. So therefore, I have very few black friends, just a handful, because there's, there's not many black conservatives. But I have a good friend of mine whose, whose children, teenage sons, call me Uncle Steve. And I think about them every day in the, the environment they're in with their family and friends who are just telling them over and over about how they should vote for Barack Obama. Now, one thing I can never do is be in a room full of only black people. So I don't know what goes on in that conversation, but I do know that there's something wrong there when you're going to pick anybody over by their color rather than what they're going to do for you and your family. Well, and based on, like Dr. Key said, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King said, we should judge people on the content of their character, not by the color of their skin. And so for the black community to, to vote for people that not only want to destroy them physically, like with Planned Parenthood, but want to destroy them financially, I'm perplexed. I don't get it, and it, it's on my mind night and day, but, but I believe oh. the GOP needs to get into this debate vigorously and just stick to it. The, they've got to get tough and talk about how we're here for everybody, not just white people or black people or any certain group of people, but we're here for Americans who want to make this a free country and a better country. But, but what's going on with the black community now is wrong. Obama's destroying them. And the black community doesn't deserve this. But if anybody should be demanding freedom, demanding a, a better way of life in America, it should be the black community. But they're taking the opposite role. They're taking the role of we're going to support the person who's going to destroy us in every way, shape, or form. I don't get it. Well, go ahead, Dr. Keith. No, I was just going to say, see, I, I have dealt with this problem throughout my uh, life, really, adult life, particularly life in politics. Uh, and I think one of the challenges, and I'm discovering it's not confined to uh, racial things, is that human beings develop habits, habits of, uh, of, of action and opinion that they don't re-examine in the light of the facts. Uh, and that they don't re-examine in terms of, of taking their real beliefs, the core beliefs that they live by and guide their lives and choices at the level of their family and so forth, by, and, and, 
and carry the common sense that results from that to their judgments as citizens. Uh, and I have found that this is particularly true uh, with respect to uh, the black community, and I fought it out in family and in other uh, ways all my, uh, all my life. Uh, and what is the problem? The problem is that you have people who profess to believe in God who then follow a godless elite as they come out the way Obama recently did for homosexual marriage and support the, uh, the abortion killing of babies, which, by the way, when you examine issues like that, and this is one of the things that I have always faulted uh, the so-called Republicans for, the GOP elite leadership, that you have issues like that that are at the core of the moral identity of the black community. That if you look at the heritage and history, as I did in my book some years back, uh, 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 Masters of the Dream, uh, The Strength and Betrayal of Black America, there's a deep moral core connected to Christian understanding, helped to sustain people uh, during the terrible trials and tribulations that occurred in black history and slavery and Jim Crow and all of this. Uh, and that then come out on the other side with people who go to church and believe in God and read the Bible and think that the family uh, is uh, for God's purpose of procreation. It's over. Now there's sin and their weakness and there's failings just like everybody else. But that sense of a basic standard endowed by God, that's very strong. And yet time and time again, including right now, people will act as if you're going to drive a wedge by talking about money issues. When at the end of the day, I think most of us understand at some deep level of experience and common sense that what drives a lot of the money problems, whether as individuals, families, communities, uh, and as a nation, uh, uh, is the fact that we have backed away from a moral understanding of who we are. Take, for instance, the simple, long-standing, persistent, and egregious fact that if you compare the fate of Two parent families, mother, father, raising children, two families that are broken in that sense, where father alone, mother alone, but especially mothers alone, trying to raise families. Economically, the disparity is pronounced, significant, and has persisted throughout my lifetime. And what do we find? We find that this elitist class of ours, regardless of race and so forth, going down a road to normalize and legitimize the destruction of our respect for the God-endowed natural family based on that function of procreation and child rearing. Uh, and then want to stand up and tell folks how much they're doing for people in this group and that group and the other group, including the black community. The black family structure utterly destroyed in the course of the years of these socialist programs and welfare programs that contributed greatly to that destruction. The end result being that you can't make as good headway in the good times and you're smacked to the wall in the bad times uh, because you don't have that social, social structure that helps people to work together and survive through good times and bad. Uh, and, and, and yeah, when you try to get up, as I used to, and talk about this and say this is a way we, but I want to talk about it. Let's just talk about this economic thing and that economic thing and ignore the fact that the heart of it all is the failure to maintain the moral understanding and values and instead go down this road of godless scientific materialism that ends in precisely the sort of socialism that Obama typifies and wants to impose uh, on this country. And I think that's been... I think we just lost uh, Dr. Keyes. We're going to take a break and then we come back. We'll get him back, so stay tuned, folks. This is Talk to Solomon. I like to eat. You like to eat? We all do. And usually we run to the grocery store, we run to the convenience store, uh, or we have something in the fridge. But power's been out in parts of this country in the last few weeks. Uh, we don't know what's going to come down the pike economically. Smart people are putting in food. Alpine Air Gourmet Reserves is a line of foods that you can put away that will last for a very long time. You know, they say eat what you store and store what you eat. This is great tasting stuff, healthy for you a full line, you go to our website, 
cpnlive.com and click on the button for Alpine Air Gourmet Reserves and see all the different things we have. This is good tasting food. It's reasonably priced. It will last. And it's worth its weight in gold if a problem arises. I know you don't think there's going to be anything that goes wrong. Actually, you do. This is smart. This is smart insurance. This is smart preparation. This is smart thinking. You have kids. You have a spouse. You have parents. You have dependents. Uh, you have an appetite. All those things can be addressed by a, a, a frugal but smart investment in Alpine Air Gourmet Reserves. Try them out. You will be tickled to death with the taste of them. You know what? In many cases, people start to eat this and they think, heck, this tastes better and costs less than what you're going to the grocery store and buy. CPNLive.com. Check it out. Hey, my name is Stan Solomon, and you know if I have something to say, I'll say it. And I'll only tell you the truth because I'm a Republican, not a Democrat. Democrats always lie. Republicans only lie half the time. I don't lie at all. This is the fuel mule. It's an extraordinary product that was developed by a friend of mine, an engineer. And it increases the fuel mileage on your vehicle. If you have a combustion engine, this will increase your mileage by 10 to 20 percent. It bolts around your fuel line. You can install it yourself or have your mechanic do it. It is an extraordinary item, and it flat works. I've been using it for more than 10 years. It's increased my mileage on every vehicle I put it on. And by the way, it will last forever. You can get rid of your vehicle. Just take it off and put it on the next one. Go to cpnlive.com. You'll have more information there. You can order it right there. We absolutely guarantee you'll be satisfied. The Fuel Mule. It's a way to kick down your cost of fuel and kick up your mileage. Don't you love the name? I thought of it. The Fuel Mule. Let me ask you a question. Do you like being sick? I have in my hand an incredible product. It's called TR10 Super Colloidal Silver. TR10 stands for a trace to the negative 10th power. The particles in this silver product are 6 to 8 angstroms, 6 to 8 10 billionths of a meter. Now listen to me. Silver has been the magic bullet for all of human existence. The Egyptians used silver instruments. We use silverware. They put silver in your teeth because nothing can grow on silver. Silver will kill anything but liberalism. I'm working on that. This product, you go to cpnlive.com, buy one core of this product, it will last you for a very long time. Anytime you feel like you've been exposed to something bad, take some of this product, spray it in your mouth, or take a little bit and gargle it, swallow it, it will kill any pathogen. The average antibiotic kills 10 to 20 different pathogens. This product will kill 700 plus. Do yourself a favor. Do your family a favor. Do your doctor a favor. He's tired of seeing you. Get super colloidal silver. Go to cpnlive.com. Order the product. It's $29.95 plus shipping. I think it's $39.95 delivered any place in America right to your door. It's worth 10 times that. Check it out. If you're not 100% happy, just return it and we'll give you your money back.